It was the autumn of A.D. 32, and the ancient city of Jerusalem lay enveloped in the stillness of the early morning hours. Its stone streets, which would soon bustle with the day's activities, were now silent. The walls, which had stood witness to countless histories, seemed to hold their breath as if they too understood the gravity of the day. In the heart of the city, the magnificent temple stood, its golden facade reflecting the first faint glimmers of dawn. It was here that the very heartbeat of the Jewish nation pulsed, and today that heartbeat was laden with anticipation. Inside his chambers, Caiaphas, the high priest, was already awake. The weight of his role pressed heavily upon him. As he carefully laid aside his usual golden garments, he felt the enormity of the day's significance. Today was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and in humble white linen robes he must stand not as the esteemed leader of the nation of Israel, but as a humble servant and intercessor between the Hebrew people and the Almighty. His mind wandered back to the foot of Mount Sinai, where amidst the thunder and smoke, Moses received the sacred rites that he, Caiaphas, was now entrusted to perform. This annual ritual was Israel's lifeline, a divine provision ensuring their spiritual survival. Without this act of atonement, the collective sins of the nation of Israel would remain, casting a shadow between them and their God. Outside, the city began to stir. The faithful, wrapped in prayer shawls, made their way to the temple, their hearts heavy with personal reflections and silent prayers. They came seeking forgiveness, renewal, and the hope of a fresh start. The air was thick with expectancy. Would the God of their forefathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, extend his mercy for another year? Or would the weight of their transgressions lead to divine judgment? As the horizon painted itself with the hues of a new day, all of Jerusalem turned its gaze towards the temple, and at its center stood Caiaphas, holding their fate in his hands. The sun's rays began to pierce through the narrow streets of Jerusalem, casting long shadows that seemed to hint at the intricate web of power and politics that underpinned the city. At the heart of this web was the influential family of Annas, a dynasty that had, over the years, woven itself into the very fabric of Jerusalem's religious and political life. Caiaphas, the current high priest, was a key strand in this web. As the son-in-law to Annas, he was part of a lineage that boasted not one, but six high priests. It was an unprecedented concentration of religious authority within a single family and it did not go unnoticed. The common folk whispered about it in hushed tones, while the elite navigated this landscape with a mix of respect, envy, and at times, trepidation. But the priesthood, once a divine calling, had now become a pawn in a larger game. The mighty Roman Empire, with its insatiable appetite for control, had its talons deep in the affairs of Jerusalem. The sacred office of the high priest was no longer just a spiritual mantle passed down through the annals of Levitical lineage. It had become a position to be bartered, bought, and at times bestowed by Roman governors seeking to placate or control the Jewish populace. This Roman oversight, while ensuring a semblance of peace, often came at the cost of genuine spiritual leadership. Israel's shepherds had gone astray. The result was a priesthood that, under the likes of Caiaphas and his kin, often prioritized political expediency over true spiritual guidance. The temple, 
meant to be a house of prayer, had in parts become a den of robbery and deceit. The ordinary people, already burdened by Roman taxes and regulations, now also faced a religious system that seemed more interested in maintaining its own status and wealth than in tending to the spiritual needs of the flock. In the shadow of the Grand Temple, marketplaces thrived, money changers shouted their rates, and merchants peddled their sacrificial animals at exorbitant prices. All these activities, while ostensibly serving the needs of the pilgrims, were in reality feeding the coffers of the elite, further deepening the chasm between the religious leaders and the common man. As Caiaphas prepared for the most sacred of rituals on Yom Kippur, the city around him buzzed with the mix of genuine piety and simmering discontent. The political landscape, with its intertwining of religious duty and personal ambition, set the stage for a clash between the old ways and the revolutionary teachings of a carpenter from Nazareth. The soft chime of bells echoed through the vast chambers of the temple as Caiaphas made his solemn procession towards the Holy of Holies. Each step was deliberate, each chime a reminder of the gravity of the moment. Attached to the hem of his garment, these bells served as both an auditory symbol of his sacred duty and a haunting reminder of the potential cost of any misstep within the sacred chamber. Pushing aside the thick veil, Caiaphas stepped into the inner sanctum, carrying with him the blood of a bull, a necessary offering to atone for his own sins before he could intercede for the people. The room, though small, held an immeasurable weight of history and expectation. It was here that the Ark of the Covenant rested, where once the tangible Shekinah glory of God manifested, filling the space with the divine radiance that was both awe-inspiring and terrifying. But now, that radiant presence was conspicuously absent. The room was shrouded in a profound stillness, its silence echoing the mournful vision of the prophet Ezekiel, he had seen the glory of God depart from the temple, moving eastward, leaving behind a void that no ritual, no matter how elaborate, could fill. This departure was not a whimsical act of a capricious deity, but the heart-wrenching decision of a God who felt the sting of rejection from the very people he had chosen. Yet in the face of this divine absence, the rituals continued. The religious elite, perhaps out of habit, pride, or sheer obstinance, maintained the ceremonies, the sacrifices, the traditions, all the while missing the very heart of their faith. The temple, which should have been a beacon of God's presence, had become a monument to human religiosity, and in this void a profound truth emerged. Religion, devoid of the living presence of God, is not just empty, it's dead. It becomes a hollow echo, a shadow of what was intended, a tragic testament to the human capacity to miss the very essence of faith. As Caiaphas sprinkled the blood upon the mercy seat, perhaps somewhere deep within, a pang of longing stirred, a yearning for the genuine communion that once was. But the weight of tradition politics, and personal ambition often drowns out such inner stirrings, leaving behind only the shell of a ritual, bereft of its soul. The temple courtyard bustled with activity as priests and Levites went about their duties. Amidst the throngs of worshipers, the casting of lots commenced an ancient ritual determining the fate of two goats. One would be sacrificed, its lifeblood spilling onto the altar, a vivid crimson testament to the grievous cost of sin and the profound need for atonement. The other, designated as the scapegoat, would bear a different but equally significant role. 
As the high priest laid his hands upon the scapegoat's head, he symbolically transferred the collective sins of the nation onto this innocent creature. With the weight of Israel's transgressions upon it, the goat, known as Azazel in Hebrew, was led away, disappearing into the vast wilderness, taking with it the sins of a people and symbolizing God's merciful act of forgetting and removal. This poignant ritual, echoing through the annals of time, painted a vivid picture of substitutionary atonement. The innocent, standing in the place of the guilty, bearing the weight of sin, and offering a path to reconciliation. It was a divine dance of justice and mercy, where God's righteous demands met His boundless love. Yet even as the scapegoat vanished from sight, and the blood of the sacrificed goat dried on the altar, a deeper, more profound narrative was unfolding. Beyond the confines of the temple walls, amidst the cobbled streets of Jerusalem, walked the embodiment of God's ultimate mercy. The true Lamb, foretold by prophets and foreshadowed by countless sacrifices, was among them. Jesus, the Lamb of God, was preparing for the culmination of his earthly mission. While Caiaphas and the religious elite remained ensnared in the trappings of ritual, the world's true high priest was moving inexorably towards his destined hour, a sacrifice that would forever bridge the chasm between humanity and the divine, restoring the fellowship with God that Adam had lost. The golden glow of the temple's inner sanctum dimmed as Caiaphas prepared to re-enter the Holy of Holies. As he approached, his fingers grazed the heavy fabric of the veil, causing the embroidered cherubim to shimmer momentarily, as if stirred by an ancient wind. These celestial guardians, intricately woven into the fabric, seemed to whisper tales of a time long past, a time of innocence and communion. Their outstretched wings evoked memories of a pristine garden, where the first man and woman walked side by side with their Creator, basking in the unfiltered glow of His presence. But that idyllic scene was marred by rebellion, and as a result, cherubim with flaming swords were stationed at Eden's entrance, ensuring that humanity could no longer access the way to the Tree of Life. The path to unbroken fellowship was severed, and the weight of that separation was felt with every heartbeat. Yet this veil, with its silent sentinels, was more than just a barrier. It was a canvas of hope. As Caiaphas moved closer, the blood of the sacrifice in hand, the veil stood as a testament to the profound rift caused by sin. But it also hinted at a promise a future where the divide would be mended, where the cherubim would no longer stand as guards, but as heralds, announcing the restoration of all things. For unbeknownst to Caiaphas, the days of this veil were numbered. Very soon, in a moment of divine intervention and a profound act of sacrificial love, this veil would be torn asunder, not by human hands, but by the very hand of God. And the cherubim, once symbols of humanity's exile from Eden, would transform into beacons of hope, signaling a new era where man could once again walk in unbroken fellowship with God. <laughs>